happy Tuesday. How are we doing, Savvy family? It's good to be hanging with you. I am excited as I usually am on Tuesdays because it's one of my favorite times of the week. I get to just sit and hang out with you guys and chat about all things virtual assistants. And it just gets me back to my roots. It gets me back to, you know, feeling, man, you guys are in the thick of it dealing with choosing your pricing and your packaging and and learning the courage to um, to really choose your rate and to stick with it. You guys are in the middle of learning how to market, learning how to be good marketers, learning how to, you know, get your business out into the world. And there's just something so exciting to me about people understanding the freedom life. I have a, my best friend who I've been talking to about virtual assistants for years, um, is, is starting a virtual bookkeeping company actually. And, um, and we sat down and it was just, it was so nice just to be like, you see it, right? Like you see like this entrepreneurship bug and this idea that, oh my gosh, I could, you know, she has uh, an eight month old baby now that they you know, tried for years and years and years and finally have this miracle baby. And it's like, um, she's like, I'm just thinking ahead to, you know, once this business grows, I'll be able to take off for school activities or if he has a sick day, like, it's like, I don't have to ask a boss to, you know, take off for the day. And just that, that whole concept of the freedom life. And I'm like, yes, you see it, you know, and I don't know if anybody else feels that same way, but it's just so exciting to me. So anything that we can do, uh, as the virtual savvy to help you guys get to that place, that's our goal. That's our dream and our vision, right? So um, I'd love to know where you're joining me from and what stage of business are you at? Are you at a place where you're just kind of getting started? You're deciding on your services. You're deciding what you want to offer. Uh, maybe, you know, stepping into marketing your business. Have you started getting the word out? Do you have a client yet? Are you in that scaling phase where you're building a team, etc.? No matter what phase you're at, today is going to be a really awesome discussion. We're going to be talking all about rejection. Yay, right? <laughs> Everyone's favorite topic, rejection. Um, but I, I really actually like this discussion because I don't know about you guys, but it is, it's one of my biggest fears and was one of my biggest fears stepping into virtual assistance. It's like, I didn't have as much fears related to my services. I was like, okay, here's, I, I can't do everything, but these few things I can do. And I feel confident in these few services. Right. And I'm going to start there. Um, it was just when I it came to marketing, um, I felt like I could get the word out, but it was more like, the fear of what's going to happen once I get the word out, right? Once I start telling people about my business. And so that's what I want to talk about today. I'm going to just kind of share my story and some of the things that helped um, in those beginning years of dealing with rejection. And honestly, these same principles are things that I apply even today when I'm scared about what other people will think or what other people are going to do, or if I have a sales call, right? Um, so uh, I'm excited to dive into this. And we've got a few of you guys here with us. Uh, Wendy, so good to see you here. Wendy signed up for our Savvy System course. I'm so excited to have you as a Savvy System student. We have a whole section on handling objections and rejection inside of the course, inside of the marketing section. So make sure to check that as well, Wendy. Um, time is my biggest obstacle right now, Michelle. I totally understand that. Uh, we have tons of resources on time management as well. Anna says, I have four clients and three potentials. Excited to see my business. And I'm thinking about the next day of scaling. Yay. Congratulations. That's amazing. Uh, and Cheryl says, just starting printing my pace plan, getting my work plan printed as a book. Ooh, so exciting. Another Savvy System student joining us here. All right. So let's dive into this, the VA's guide to handling rejection. So again, I'm going to just glean from some of my personal experience. So I think step number one, or I don't know if it's a step, but just the concept that I want to like portray first is guys, it is totally normal to fear rejection. Okay. And I think that the, one of the biggest mindset pieces, um, that we have to be able to get over is feeling like I'm the only one that feels this way. Right. 
And so for me, there is momentum and there's confidence just in knowing I'm not alone. And that's why this, this community is so important. Whether you're a savvy system student and if you're in our big VA savvies community, guys, lean on that community, lean on your friends who are also starting businesses, right? Because other people just don't really get it. Like if you're not in the game, you know, you can, you can watch from the sidelines and you can say, Oh, you know, I would have done this differently or they should have made that shot or I would have blocked this person. I'm talking like I know sports. Uh <laughs> But it's different if you're in the game and you're talking about the game to other people who are in the game. So there's something so important about having a community around you of people who get it right and say, yeah, I fear rejection too. And here's what I do about that. So I ask you guys, let's make this interactive. Do you have that? Let me know in the comments. Do you feel like you have even just one person that you can talk to and just be real with about your journey as a virtual assistant? Let me know in the comments. So um, th that's first just to say it's absolutely normal to fear rejection. And really, um, when we are fearing rejection, what we're fearing most is the unknown, right? And so there's something really powerful about talking to other people who have been there, done that, because it can give us some insight into the unknown and we can be more prepared for it, right? It doesn't fully take away the fear, but if you take away some of that unknown, it does take away some of it. So let's go into um, what do you do with it? Once you recognize that it's there, right? Like the fear's there. <laughs> we can't just be like, oh, let me just push it aside and pretend like it doesn't exist. Like that doesn't help anybody, right? So what do we actually do with the fear once we recognize it's here? It's okay that I have it. Now what? That's what I want to talk about. Okay. Um, so, oh, good. Joanne says, I have two people I can tell my fears to. I love that. Perfect. All right, so let's go through the steps of what I believe can be super helpful to overcoming your fear. So I'm going to type them out here. Remember your, what do you think I'm going to say? Remember your why is step number one. So when I first started my virtual assistant business, I had a, uh, a almost two-year-old at home and I was pregnant with my second child. And I was, we were living in this basement apartment. My husband was working these 13 hour days. We lived in Northern Virginia. So we'd have to drive two hours to work, two hours home from work. Right. Like, and I remember thinking I'm about to have another kid and we are financially already strapped. Like I've got to think of something like there's got to be a way that I don't have to in Northern Virginia, putting your kids in daycare was just as expensive. <laughs> like I would literally just be trading that time at work for, um, for daycare. I'm like, well, that doesn't really help our scenario. Right. So what is a way that I can take care of my kids, which was what my plan was, um, to be a stay at home mom, which I did eventually get some help in that department, <laughs> nothing wrong with that. But like, you know, what can I do to bring in some extra income for our family? And I had this driving why of man, I, I want to be there for my kids, but I also want to provide for me financially. And so, I think that one, like the, it's, it's where it starts, right? It's not the only step, but the first step in dealing with rejection is knowing why you're doing this in the first place. Because if that why, if you can magnify it and focus on it and keep it in the forefront of your mind, I don't know if you guys have like a little post-it note, right? Or some people will take like, uh, will print it out pretty and put it in a picture frame and have it in their office. Or maybe it is something around your kids, right? And so you literally just have a picture of your kids in your office. You're like, that's my why, that's my why, that's my why. If you can magnify your why, sometimes it can help that fear seem not as big and not so scary. So do you know, know your why? Let me know in the comments if you already have your why. This is step number one to overcoming your fear of rejection. Um, next is to, hold on, I'm typing these out as we go. Anybody have a tip? Anybody have I guess of what number two is. Number one is remember your why. Number two is an acceptance piece, right? I'm a realist. I don't know how many of you guys would be like self-proclaimed realists. <laughs> like I am a dreamer, but I've also put a realist like smash together. So I'm like, here's my dream and here's reality. And let me put them together and see what can really happen. Right. And so, um, I think that one of the biggest phases about 
accepting your fear. We talk a lot about how like fear is scariest when it's unknown, when it's behind you, when it's looming. But if you can take it and you can look it straight in the face, right? And say, this is my fear. I'm going to identify it. What is it? And a lot of times it's that worst case scenario, right? So like, actually, if you're feeling scared, if you're feeling nervous, there's something really powerful about taking that nervousness. And for me, it's always journaling, right? Any journalers, um, any journaling fans. So I will just write it out. Like, what am I actually afraid of? Cause I feel the feelings of fear, right? Um, but sometimes it takes a little while for my head to catch up with my heart and to say, what am I actually feeling here? And what am I actually trying to overcome the fear of? Right. So I will identify it. I am scared that this person is going to say no, that they're going to be mean, that they're not going to like me and I'm not going to get this client and I'm going to feel bad about myself. Right. Like that's, I don't know about you. That's like, that's my fear. Right. It's that fear of them being like, no. And even above being no, like, I just, I hate uncomfortable conversations. I hate, I don't like you know, I'm a peacekeeper. So if if I'm like, if somebody's like nasty towards me, like if I say something wrong and they're nasty towards me and it ends up, I'm like, Oh, awkward. You know, I just, I hate that. I hate that uncomfortable feeling. Okay. So if that's you or whatever it is, maybe you have a different worst case scenario in your brain about, and I'm like, I'm thinking specifically like going into a discovery call or announcing your business on Facebook or whatever you feel like your next step is in marketing that you may be rejected for, right? You remember your why, and then you accept the worst case scenario. So for me, it's that, okay, if I go into this discovery call and they say no, and even if they're, even if the worst case, they're just mean about it, they're just nasty. Like I would never charge or I would never pay those rates. I can't believe you think that this is worth it, blah, 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 blah. By the way, the percentage chance of the worst case scenario actually happening is probably very slim. I think it's important to know, like in all my years of being a virtual assistant, at no point did somebody be like, I can't believe you're a terrible human being for charging those rates, you know, like, but that's, that's what my worst case scenario in my brain is that I'm fearing. Right. So I think for me, I have to get to that worst case scenario, identify it, and then be like, even if that happened, I'd still be okay. Right. Like I still have worth as a human. I'm still a good mom. I'm still a good business owner. I'm still all of the things like it it would hurt but it wouldn't kill me. Right. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah. Everybody. Okay. So (laughs) I think that for me, that is a huge step in this whole process is just identifying that identifying what is the biggest, scariest thing and getting to a point where we were like, okay, even if that happens, I can do this. Oh no. Is the sound cutting out for anybody else? Let me know. I actually switched to a new mic so I can switch back over if I need to. Let me know in the comments if we're having trouble hearing me. Let me know. Let me know. Let me know. I've had trouble with this mic in the past. So, but we came up with a new system. It's supposed to work now. So let me know in the comments if you can hear me. Okay. Or if I need to switch mics. All right. So, um, number one, your why number two, except the worst case scenario. Um, Oh, this is so good. Michelle added, remember that one bad experience is not a sum total experience. Correct. Like if you have one bad experience, it does not mean that every other experience is going to go the same way. Right. Um, Really, really good point. I love that. Okay. So still cutting out. All right. So let me just switch mics real quick for you guys. Thank you. Sorry about that. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Okay, we'll use this one just in case. (laughs) All right, thanks for letting me know, guys. All right, so what is the next step? You're gonna remember your why, you're gonna accept the worst case scenario. Third, here we go. You're gonna improve your odds, okay? So think about it this way. If the scariest part of rejection is is really that unknown it's it's fear of the unknown i just don't know how this is going to go so i fill in the story of how i think the worst case it could go right so we prepare ourselves for that worst case but then we can actually improve our odds 
that that worst case scenario won't happen, right? And there's so many different ways that we can do this. And um, this is this is what I really want to lean into today. Um, a big part of it is identifying your leads ahead of time. So I don't know how many of you guys have a website already, or if you have a portfolio that you send to your clients before you talk to them. Some people will disagree with me and that's fine. Um, I'm a huge fan of being very forward with your pricing. If you have your the most ideal client, you love their business, they're passionate about what they do, but they can't afford your rates, it's just not going to be a great fit, right? Or again, if you research this client and you don't align with their values, you're, you, there's something about their business that makes you go, oh, I just don't know if I'd be really comfortable personally working with that type of business owner. Guys, recognize those red flags ahead of time. Do your research before you get on a discovery call with a client, before you pitch a client and really know, man, I, you'll never know 100%, right? Um, but the more research that you can do ahead of time and getting uh, prepared for that discovery call, being prepared before you do that pitch and knowing, kind of pre-qualifying, if, if you have an intake form on your website, ask the questions that are, are, are going to cover some of their biggest objections, right? Um, ask them about their, their, their company culture. Ask them about the, um, their mission statement. Like, well, why do you do what you do? Like, let me get passionate about the thing that you're passionate about. Ask them about, you know, what is the price range that you're looking for for this service, right? Um, note that my services start at $2,000 or whatever and, and have that in an intake form. Some of those biggest objections can be handled before a call even begins by a really great intake form or by just having information in your portfolio or your website, right? Next, another way to improve your odds is to have a plan. And this is really specific. Um, it can be marketing in general, but I love talking about this specifically with discovery calls. So um, discovery calls are just an incredible way for you to not only convince a client to work with you, but for you to see if a client is going to be a good fit for you. And one of the things that you can do is come into that call with a plan. So um, in the past, we've done a training uh, with my my partner in crime, Rachel, um, our, our senior director of product, she and I came together and we did an awesome training. If you go to the virtual savvy.com slash YouTube, you can look at all of our previous live streams and you can search for discovery call, right? You can discovery call the virtual savvy discovery call Abby Ashley on YouTube. You're going to find this awesome talk that Rachel and I did just talking about what is a good discovery call, right? What does that process look like? Um, and so really, really coming in with a plan. What am I going to say? What am I going to talk about? What are the questions I'm going to kind of ask, right? Coming in with a plan um, is not only going to help you have more confidence and fear the rejection less, but it's actually going to make you, you better at improving your odds. It's actually going to increase the chance the person's going to say yes, that it's not going to turn to that worst case scenario, right? So coming in with a plan. How many of you guys already have like a discovery call process? You have maybe it's a sheet or a checklist or some way that you already go into discovery calls knowing this is what I'm going to say. If you're a Savvy System student, the answer is yes, you do. It is inside of your course. We have an entire lesson just devoted to discovery calls and we have a printout, uh, a way for you to be really, really prepared in that. So come with a, up with a plan. Second, be confident in your packages. Guys, I will say this. If there are some people that are like fake it till you make it type of people, I am a don't fake it, be confident, right? Like be confident. And even if it means that you have to adjust your pricing, your packages to be able to portray yourself confidently, I'm okay with that. Now, am I okay with you coming in and saying, I'm gonna charge? $7 an hour, $5 an hour, right? Like you need to charge enough that you're going to be able, that's going to be worth it at the end of the day. That's why most of our VAs start their rates around $30 an hour, right? Because after taxes, expenses, you want to be making a good income at the end of the day. However, um, if you look at that $30 an hour as a starting point and you're like, oh, I don't know if I can do it, right? Like start at 25, start at 20, right? Start at a place where you're going to say, you know what? Nope, this, this is good. Like I feel good at this rate. I'm going to be confident and then get that first client at that rate. Second client, bump, 
your package up. Okay, now I'm charging $27 an hour. By my third discovery call, I'm saying my rate is $30 an hour, right? And you can slowly do that incremental pricing increase so that as your confidence grows and as your experience grows, your rate grows as well, right? So it's just another way to improve your odds. You wanna come with a plan. You wanna be confident in your packages. <clears throat> I love this one make it a metric, right? How else do you improve your odds of your discovery calls going well is one, start to think, well, one, start to keep track of how many discovery calls you're having and how many of those turn into yeses. And then once you know that number, it doesn't come, oh, I failed. I, I, you know, I bombed another discovery call, right? Um, it becomes, once you've done them enough, okay, I know that I can close 25% of my calls. So one out of every four is gonna be a yes, right? Or I can I can close 50, I can close 75%. So it, it doesn't matter, right? But if you know, if you keep track long enough and you're increasing, right? You wanna be improving over time too, but that no, you might've done a perfect job. It might just not be right time for them. And you can say, okay, that's that's one step closer to a yes, right? If you actually know your numbers, know your metrics. So um, a lot of times in business, we don't know what to track. We look at metrics and we're like, oh, that seems scary. Like, I don't, I don't know what I should be tracking. At the end of the day, if you're tracking the money coming in and coming out, right? Tracking your expenses and tracking your... Um, your marketing metrics, largely how many discovery calls, how many outreaches do I need to do to get a discovery call? How many job ops do I need to apply for to get a discovery call? Then how many discovery calls do I need to do to get a yes, right? Track those numbers because then a yes doesn't or a no doesn't seem so like, oh, I failed. I'll never return from this. It's like, nope. All right. One of four. The next three, I'm going to land one of these three, right? And it becomes a little bit more of a game. So, and this, these, honestly, a lot of these principles are general sales call, like sales principles um, in general. If you guys have ever, uh, Springfield, Missouri, I never actually worked at one, but a ton of my friends, we have like, especially in like the 90s and early 2000s, we just have tons of those like vacation call centers here. I don't know if it's a thing anywhere else, but like Springfield, back, especially when I was in high school, all my friends were getting jobs at these places where you would go and you would literally call people and try to sell them vacation packages. It literally sounds like the worst job on the planet. I never did it. I was a waitress at Shoney's. Thank you. Um, so like, uh, but okay, let's take a call from like the sales world, right? Let's, let's take a cue from them. Literally, it would be you make a hundred calls and one out of a hundred is going to be a yes, right? And so it was all about just like, it was kind of a numbers game, at least what my friends told me, right? It's a numbers game to hit, hit your numbers, hit your numbers, hit your numbers. And a lot of times, especially in the cold calling vacation sales world, which is icky, right? You are, you're closing one out of a hundred. So it's just one step closer, one step closer. And if you can increase those odds, awesome. And then guys, if you're tracking those metrics, if you're tracking, okay, it takes this many job opportunities to get a discovery call. It takes this many discovery calls to get a client. What you can do after tracking that over a while is you say, hmm, what if I just increased one of these, right? Like what if I increased if I got better at sales calls or what if I increase the number of job opportunities I'm applying for? What if I, if I choose another marketing method to get more discovery calls, right? Once you start tracking that, then you can see how pivots and adjustments can be made. But if you're just taking it day to day, one discovery at a call, one discovery call at a time and just beating yourself up after every no, then you're not making progress. Right. Um, I heard somebody say the other day, I forget where it was. I think it was probably in one of my kids like Disney movies. I'm pretty sure it was High School Musical 2. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm going through High School Musical with my daughter right now, all three of them. So, um, but they essentially said like failure, failure is not making a mistake. Failure is not falling down. It's failure is if you don't get back up, right? So don't think of your discovery calls as, hey, if they say a no, then I'm a failure. I failed. No. A failure is if you fail on that discovery call, if it doesn't go well, if you get a no and then you quit, right? That is what we're not gonna go to. So just a little, you know, inspiration from Zac Efron. I don't know if it really was High School Musical too. <laughs> I'm like, I heard it from somewhere, but I forget where it was. Um, so, so good. Um, okay, you guys are getting better sound now. Good, I wanted to check, check this. Out. All right. So 
You're going to improve your odds of a yes by coming up with a plan, being confident in your packages, make it a metric, right? You're just one step closer to a yes. And then this is, this is one of the biggest ways that I believe that you can improve your odds of a yes. Um, become a student of sales strategy. Guys, there's so much. The Savvy System has a ton of information on sales. But guys, there's so much that you can learn even from the external world. And I love the idea of just diving right into the thing that I'm scared of. And so many of you guys are re like, how many researchers, how many learners are in the room, right? Uh, I become more confident with research. So if I am really, really scared of rejection in my discovery calls, what if I just became amazing? It became so knowledgeable about sales strategy and the amount of YouTube videos, the amount of information that is on the internet now, it might not even be related to our industry, right? Um, but there's just information on how to close a sales call, how to, um, how to increase conversions, how to handle objections on sales calls. There's, there's just so much information out there, you guys. So consume it, right? Um, obviously put it into practice as well, uh, but be a learner of sales, like be a student of sales strategy. And this is one of the things um, I would say, if you get one thing, like one takeaway from today's little chat about handling rejection is to dive into sales strategy. Uh, because it will increase your confidence. The more knowledge you know, the more equipped that you feel with your sales processes and with your sales strategy, you come in with a plan, you feel confident in your pricing, and then you know, okay, here are the videos that I've watched. Here's my information in the back of my head on how I'm going to handle these sales calls, how I'm going to handle these discovery calls, right? Um, that knowledge is going to further equip you. Um and and then I think the last thing after we've, you know, we're talking about how to handle rejection, we're going to remember our why, we're going to accept the worst case scenario, we're going to improve your odds in all these different ways that we've talked about. Um, the last part is, type it in, sorry, I just started typing these in ahead of time, <laughs> is remember it's not forever, okay? I'll men I've mentioned this before and I'll mention it again. If you talk to any virtual assistant that has been doing this for, you know, two, three years, and you say, where do you, where do you get your leads from? Where, where do all your clients come from? Hands down, almost every single other person I talk to in that category has been running their business for two or three years, has a steady stream, like running a successful business for two or three years. What's the number one answer they're going to get? You guys let me know in the comments. What do you think it is? It is uh, referrals. Okay. So there is an, and how much easier you guys, it's so much easier to convert a referral than any other type of leads in sales, right? We're taught, we're gleaning from outside sales strategies today in sales is the difference between a cold lead and a warm lead, right? A warm lead is so much easier to convert than a cold lead. And that's where the personal referrals come in. And so over time, the more that you're doing work for people, the more that you're just doing great work for the clients that you're working with, you're going to get more and more referrals. So know that the season of feeling like it's new and feeling like it's scary and fearing the unknown, it's not forever. Before long, and I'm not going to say that the fear will 100% go away, right? I've talked to world-renowned speakers who say, I still get butterflies before I step on stage. Like there is an element that you're never fully going to gonna be prepared or it's not going to be so easy that you just don't even care about it anymore, likely, right? That's why Ruth Sukup, she always says, do it scared, right? Like, um, so there is an element of like, okay, I'm going to do the thing, even though it's scary, but know that it does lessen over time, that you do get more comfortable. Um, and just like anything else, you, you get more confident, the more that you just do it, the more that you're in it and that you practice it. Okay. And so I think that sometimes if we can take our short term fear and put it in the picture of our big term, why our big term, man, this is a journey, not a race. Right. And in the big picture, handling rejection is going to get easier over time, right? Because I'm going to increase my odds. I'm going to have more warm leads. I'm going to have practice. I'm just going to be more versed in the whole subject, right? It does get easier over time. So hang in there. Talk to the other people who have been doing this. Like I mentioned earlier, get that, that friend who you can talk and be real about 
uh, your business and, and that fear of rejection, know that it's normal. Okay, guys, um, I hope this has been helpful. Do you guys have questions, anything that I can be helping you with? We've got a little bit of time still to hang out. If you would like to do a little bit of a Q&A, I'm happy to do that. Um, as you guys are dropping those uh, questions in the comments, I want to make a quick note um, that we are very, very close to launching our new freelancer platform. Oh my goodness, you guys, it is literally about a month away from us opening it up to the public. And you guys as freelancers are going to be able to come onto the site. You're going to be able to make a beautiful portfolio that displays your services, that really captures who you are as an individual. And I hope that it's another confidence booster uh, in your tool bag for reaching out to clients. We're going to have job opportunities posted on the site. Uh, we're inviting, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of people to come onto the platform as a place to find remote job opportunities, virtual assistance job, freelance jobs. Uh, it's all going to be included. So if you're not already on the wait list, make sure that you get on it. Okay. Uh, we're so excited, guys. It's finally happening. We've been developing this for almost two years years and talk about fear of rejection right like i i still i'm like so scared i'm like here's my baby i hope you think it's pretty you know um and and it's not going to be perfect right and that's that's the thing is that action over perfection um but man what we've built is something really unique we've truly listened to you guys and we're going to be listening to you to say what is it that could be better what could we improve upon what what do you want in a freelancing platform and so I'm really, really excited for that. Um, let's see. You guys have some awesome comments here. Let's see what we've got. Oh, we have got the question earlier. Uh, Jackie Nuss? Ja ja I don't know how to say your name, but let me know in the comments <laughs> if I probably probably totally butchered it. Sorry. Um, we do not accept only women inside of our program. No. So, um, you know, I, we, we have a handful of men definitely who have joined our programs. I think our marketing is largely geared toward women, mostly because I just tell my story, right? Like I love when a business is a reflection of you and your personality. And that's what I want you for you guys too, is that your businesses is a reflection of you and your personality and your story. And so because of me and my personality and my story, how, you know, I started my business as a pregnant mom and all the things, I think we attract a lot of women for that reason, but it is not exclusive only to women. So definitely come join that group growing community of men inside of the Sappy system because they're definitely there for sure. Um, this is a great question. Michelle says, do you have a video on getting tongue tied when speaking to new people? You know, I don't have a video on it. I think that um, a big part of it is some of the things that we talked about today. I will say this, if you haven't been to live networking events, I know it is scary, might make you want to think about puking, right? But there is nothing that I will say has given me more confidence than going to live events, whether that's a conference. Um, I honestly, I wouldn't even start with a conference because conferences can be really overwhelming. It's tons of people and not as often as many opportunities for conversation, but just looking up to see if there's events in your local area. Um, and one of the things that has really helped me with events is realizing that I think one of the things that we get scared about and, you know, that that like, oh, I'm going to get tongue tied, I'm going to fumble over my words is when we're thinking about what am I going to say? What am I going to do? What am I going to talk about? When in reality, the best way to approach these network, networking events is to think, how can I be a great question asker, right? People love to talk about themselves. Maybe you don't love to talk about yourself, right? But in general, especially at networking events, People love to talk about themselves. So if you can come to a networking event with kind of that mindset of I'm not here to tell people about my business, I'm just here to learn about others, right? And you can come in with that attitude of like, I'm just going to ask questions. And so come with kind of, yeah, oh, what's your business? What do you do? Oh, wow. You know, um, are there any challenges that you're facing right now in your business? I know things have been crazy, you know, since COVID. What challenges have you been facing? Coming in with some of those questions ahead of time, I think can be a really awesome way to strike up conversation. And they may say, oh, you know, now tell me what you do. But for, in my opinion, it's so much easier to talk about my business and all of the things if I already focused a lot of the attention on them. So uh, that's just one small tip that I have for you. But I hope that that is helpful. Um, 
how do you get on the wait list? So we do have a course. It's a Savvy System. So if you go to SavvySystem.com, I don't know if I have it in my, uh, I'll create a banner for it real quick. SavvySystem.com. So if you go here, you can get on the wait list. Um, we just launched the course. And so our next live launch is not until January. However, there are sometimes opportunities and exceptions for people um, if you've just kind of found our community. So go ahead and join the wait list and we can be in touch if that uh, is something that we can get you into as well. Awesome. So excited. Oh, yeah. Please type feel failure into imposter syndrome. Let's talk about that a second. Great question, Brent and Sheila. I don't know which one I'm talking to. Sheila? Yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's talk a second about imposter syndrome. So again, I think imposter syndrome kind of is different for every person. It's a fear, right? It's the fear of what if I'm not going to show up in the way that I'm appearing that I'm going to show up, right? And so that can be in our services. It can be, am I going to be able to deliver on what I actually say I'm going to be able to deliver? Um, am I going to, um, you know, I'm talking about being like this awesome business owner who's got her stuff together, but inwardly, I feel like I've got nothing together, right? And so um, I, I totally, I understand that. And I think that it comes back, it's kind of the same principles, is identifying which part of it are you really scared of, right? Number one, realizing it's totally normal, right? Like every, is there any, like how many of you guys in the comments, how many of you have felt imposter syndrome during this entire process? Yes, me, I'm raising my hand as well, right? Um, and it's something that I still feel sometimes to this day, right? If I'm pursuing something that's bigger than me. And I think that's, that's the biggest concept of it is like imposter syndrome is simply a sign that you're pursuing something bigger than yourself. And how awesome is that? Right? Like, like that's what the people who make history do are, are people who pursue something bigger than themselves. And so I, I like, first, I think just changing that mindset of, okay, like this, this imposter syndrome is actually a sign that I'm doing something right, not a sign that I'm doing something wrong. Right. So just that small framing, I think can be huge. Um, and then diving in, what is the actual fear? What am I actually scared of? Okay, well, I am scared, like worst case scenario, that uh, a client is going to ask me to do something. I'm going to be like, yeah, I've totally got that. And then I'm royally going to mess it up. Okay, if that's the fear, number one, be okay with the worst case scenario part. It's the same process we've just talked about. Be okay with the worst case scenario. Guys, even if you mess something up, it's going to be okay. I have sent out emails on behalf of my client that say, hello, first name right? Like, you know what I'm talking about? When it doesn't fill in the person's name, it just says, hello, first name. And you're like, no, like I've sent out a hello, first name email on my own and on behalf of my clients. It happens. Mistakes happen. We do recover, but you kind of have to be okay with that worst case scenario, knowing that the odds are slim, but you are going to make mistakes um, along the way. And then how do we improve our chances? Okay. So um, if you improve your chances of that worst case scenario happening, improving your chances of that, in my opinion, is going to be, let me really know my services. Let me become a student of, like we were talking about discovery schools, become a student of sales. Let me become a student of my services. How do I just get better at them? So I'm actually increasing the odds that that worst case scenario isn't going to happen, right? So this, this is really a way to attack fear in general, in my opinion. Um, and so, and that remember, it's not going to last forever. The things that you know now compared to what you knew five or 10 years ago, you're like, oh, this used to intimidate me, but I learned it. I became a student of it. I practiced it and then I got better. So knowing that the fear around the services that you're gonna offer or the that fear of imposter syndrome isn't gonna last forever for your current scenario until you come and you have a new goal, right? And then you're like, I feel so good about my services. I feel so good about discovery calls. Like I don't have imposter syndrome with any of, the, any of those things anymore. And then we have, uh, who was it earlier that mentioned that they were going to be like, I'm getting ready. I'm going to start, I'm almost to the scaling phase. I'm going to start building a team. Uh-oh. Now we're going to have imposter syndrome around building a team because it's scary and it's bigger than ourselves. And it's something that we haven't done before, but that is normal. And it's a sign that you're doing something right. Okay. So just a small mindset, mind shift, those mindset shifts, 
mindset shifts. Say that five times fast and try not to swear. <laughs> Those mindset shifts are going to be huge, in my opinion. Um, so, so good. Yeah, okay, here's a really good question. We're just talking about all things. Uh, current savvy member, yay! Sorry, you can't see me. Hello. <laughs> Okay. I don't know if this question is for the live. Sure it is. Why not? I'm currently full-time in the corporate world. I started your course four weeks ago. I have two clients. Yay. Congratulations. I'm wanting to quit. What's holding me back is health insurance, uh, the benefits my job provides. What would you give to those of us who don't have health insurance for VAs? Yep. So a hundred percent. So I will say this, um, I will preface, I'm going to give you the short answer. The long answer is we have an entire section that I would go ahead and jump down to. Um, it's in the VA lifestyle module, all about transitioning to full time. OK, and so that's going to talk about it's going to talk about health insurance. It's going to talk about coming up with an emergency plan. It's going to talk about what what do I do, especially if I'm the sole income provider or the sole insurance provider for my family. We cover all of that. Um, I'm going to just narrow down and just for time's sake, just talk about the insurance portion, because I know it's a question that a lot of people have. So there's lots of different options. The first option that I always tell people to go to is healthcare.gov. Um, healthcare.gov, it is, you know, when when was that it put in place? 2017, 2018, I don't remember. Um, it is a great option for some. It's a terrible option for others. <laughs> I will say when my family and I went out on our own and uh, decided, hey, like let's let's look into healthcare.gov. We put in all of our information. It told us that insurance for our family would be two thousand dollars a month, and I'm like, that's not going to work. Um, whereas I've known other people that have gone in, typed in your information, and it says your insurance is going to be sixty dollars a month, right? Like it just it really depends on a lot of different factors. Uh, your family, where you live, history all these different things. So I always tell people use it as an option, right? Um, so go take a go take a look at that first. Um, another really great option is Liberty Health Share. Um, so that's what my family and I actually ended up going on to. And there's a couple of different types of health sharing. So you can look up different health sharing options. I know that with Liberty Health Share, um, our, we had a essentially, um, we had coverage up to like a million dollars per person, which I was really impressed with. Um, and I felt good and comfortable with until my family was able to get on our own insurance plan. And so essentially now our company has our own insurance plan. Um, but that is really at a point when you have at least 10 full-time employees. Like I would not offer insurance through your company until you are like not dealing with contractors, you have employees and you have the, the financial stability and the regular reoccurring income enough to set up an own, your own insurance plan. We use Gusto for that. So that is really for people that are hitting like the high six figures, I would say, uh, who are ready to take that leap. So um, yes. So for most of us, it's going to be um, Liberty Health Share, healthcare.gov, also, just talking to your local um, health and human services department, check it out le local resources. Again, I talk about SCORE, SCORE.org, going to them and say, hey, in my local community, what are other people using for uh, health insurance benefits? There's tons of entrepreneurs all around you, right? You think of all the restaurants, all the mom and pop ones. Where are all of these people getting insurance? And a lot of them, it depends. There could be uh, local uh, health services provided through a local organization or through different networks. And so a lot of it, it's kind of like start at that base scale, go to the health sharing, see if that's an option, and then checking out your local communities um, and networks to see what options are there as well. Uh, through it all, our VAs, we have several VAs who have been able to quit, do their jobs full time, and each scenario looks a little bit different. So it is one of those things that you're going to have to dive in and, and see which resources that you have individually. But again, you're a savvy system member, so you have a ton of those resources provided inside of the course as a starting point, okay? Um, so good. Uh, let's, let's do one more question, okay? Um, I'm on a situation my full-time job may be ending. Um, okay, so what can I be doing right now? So I will say this. I will. Oh, this is awesome. Good to know. My daughter found great insurance through her car insurance agents. Just someplace to check. Awesome. We'll add that to our list, talking to the other types of insurance that you have. It's kind of 
you know, there's we're, we're learning all the time of the different outlets. Um, so someone said, where do I start right now? We do have a free training that I would recommend that you check out. It's the virtual savvy.com slash BBO. That training is going to talk about choosing your pricing and your packages and how to market. Right. I, talk, I share with you some of my favorite places to find clients. So this training, we have had people literally leave this training and go out and get their first client just from it. Um, so that would be a great first place to start. Like I mentioned, we have tons of videos on YouTube. We have a blog, the virtualsavvy.com slash blog, all the resources that you would need to get started so that you're ready and you have that momentum for a January launch, okay? Uh, there's so much, you don't have to wait to get started by any means. Uh, great questions, you guys. All right. Thank you so much. This has been such a joy. I love hanging out with you every single Tuesday, you guys. I hope that you have an awesome rest of the week. Go out, face your fears, look at them straight in the face, come up with a plan, improve your odds by becoming a student of the thing you fear, right? Awesome, you guys. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day.